Uh, Ray, what inspired the film, and were there any surprises along the way? Well, um, I married into the Guerrero family. <laughs> so that was my, 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 my break. Um, I, I married Teresa Guerrero, who is the daughter of Adolfo, a really handsome guy out there <laughs> you know, in, in, in the middle of the photographs. And Adolfo was, was Pedro's older brother. And so I got to know Pedro over, over the years through, through marriage. And then in 1991, I was working on a film in Boston. I was far away from home. And, uh, and, and, th and you just can't leave the room, okay, guys? But <laughs> what happened is that Pedro uh, was starting a romance with Dixie, uh, his, his current his wife. His other wife had passed away. And his, his children were very upset with him, especially his daughters, because she was younger than his daughters. And all of a sudden, this new woman comes in. So he needed somebody to talk to. He, so he said, Ray, why don't you come down from Boston and hang out with me? I'll have wine and food. So we, we spent... We spent weekends, several weekends, and he started talking about writing Calder. And he started to give me assignments. You've got to read letters to the architects, letters, letters to the to, to the apprentice, this kind of thing. And he I, he started teaching me a write about writing Calder. And that's where the whole thing started 30 years ago. We never made the film on Calder or on Wright, but we ended up making a film on him. So that's that's a genesis of the film. And then of course the interview with him in 2010 is where kind of set things up. Yes, Elizabeth. How do you explain the way that he and Wright seem to very quickly? Uh, how do you explain the way that that Pedro and Wright so quickly seem to bond? Well, there was a little behind the scenes maneuvering, and there's two different stories. One is that his father, Pedro Warner Guerrero, the Pedro W. Guerrero, used to like to eat chile verde at the same place, and the two, they, <laughs> they two met. The other story is that they both bought paint from each other and paint for their projects at the same place. And then I think there was something that went on behind the scenes because Pedro was back home from art school and wasn't doing much, and I think they set it up. So that's when he said, why don't you go up and see that guy up there? <laughs> I think that's the story behind the story. So. Yes? Yeah. How old um, was he when you interviewed him? And do you know when he switched from black and white to color photographs? Most of his work was in black and white, just because for architecture, that's that's what you what you do. Um, and, but for his commercial projects, he had to do a lot of, a lot of color. So I think it had to do with the assignments. Uh, that's the one thing. He was 92, almost 93 years of age when we did this interview. So I, I, I'm just kind of amazed that he's that sharp. I hope I hope I live that long and that I can still talk. <laughs> Yeah, so. You have, this, you have this beautiful way of capturing still photographs of art uh, in moving image. Uh, did you have any challenges doing that? And how did you wrap your head Well, uh, I did not myself wrap my head around it. I mean, it was like it was a collaboration between Angela, Ivan, and Danny. I mean, Work, figuring out how to, how to paste these photographs, it, it, it was a challenge. And we had a screening um, about a year ago. And we, we basically we were going through photographs like this. And, and there's a few people in the room who were there. And they basically said, wait a minute, guys, slow down. Let us, let us see the pictures. And, so, and, and we also want to be very respectful of the photographers. So some of the pictures, we were showing them wide, as, as you've seen them here, and not close. And, we were told, you know, maybe you should show some close-ups, and we did. And so it, it was it was a process. And then, um, you know, the, the strips, that was, you know, a lot of these images that you've seen on the strips have never been seen before. They were never published. Because a photographer will pick out one image out of half a dozen. And we got permission to use his, all of his photographs. So you're looking at images as we pan across them that most people have never seen. And so it was... It, believe me, filmmaking is collaborative, and um, it, it took all you know a team of us to kind of figure it out. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the motivations of his leaving when he was twenty seemed to be, of course, racial discrimination. Did he talk at all about that later in his life? Was that still an issue? Did, you know, what what happened? Oh yeah. At that time? Well, you know, it took him fifty years to come back. 
I mean, that's the best thing. He came back 50 years later. I, I think leaving was a wonderful opportunity, but he had several stories. I mean, he, I mean, Pedro had the, the, a, a complex. Uh, I mean, that something he had to deal with is the fact that he was not a real popular guy of being brown, Mexican, and short in, in Mesa. And he also had a, a, a relationship, uh, he was in love with the police chief's daughter. And the uh, police chief didn't like it, and I think that's what kind of finally did it. He finally left town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had a number of, of these stories. But I, I was actually asking about later in his life. When he lived on the East Coast, he lived in New Canaan. It's not exactly a hot spot for Mexican Americans. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Well, the thing, the thing is that in, in, the, in the publishing world, he did very well. I mean, he was very, very, very charming. But he'd go to parties in his tuxedo, and people would, would assume that he was a Mexican waiter. I mean, that that is what parties in New Canaan. And there was just recently, about a week ago, a screening in New Canaan by the New Canaan Historical Society, and now they embrace him as one of their own. <laughs> before, before they, some of them, there were other architects, architects who, who were apprentices with, in, in, when he was at, at, uh, at the, Frank Lloyd, with Frank Lloyd Wright, who didn't talk to him then, and now all, all of a sudden they're, they're welcoming, welcoming him. Uh, he, very late in life, was recognized as one of the, uh, one of the modern, really great modernist uh, photographers, Lesra Stoller and Julius Schulman. He won, actually, the Julius Schulman Institute gave him an award like two months before he died. He was recognized very late in life, but he, he was about the work. He was not about trying to be famous. Uh, you know, he, you know he, 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 he took a beating throughout his life, and he finally kind of figured out who he was at about 75. And, you know, I mean, here's a guy who, who because of his experiences, had called, him, had called himself Peter, Pete, a number of, and he finally settled with Pedro. Finally felt comfortable with that. I mean, that's, that's the reality of that. Yes, Maria. Uh, the, the, the mic's coming down from here. It's a very professional operation. <laughs> what, comes to, what comes across, uh, uh, for those of us who are not fully versed in the arts, was also a sense of Wright's work, Nevelson's work, Calder's work, and um, did, how, did, how did you balance that? Or, how did you, you're looking, using him and what he sees, but it was a really, I mean, very interesting. Well, I, I think it had to do with, with, with different points in his life, when they came into his life. I mean, he was with Frank Lloyd Wright from 1939 to Frank Lloyd Wright's death in 1959. They were very, very close. And then along came Calder, and I think that was a relationship of about 16 or 17 years, and then Calder died. And then with Nevelson, he was just, you know, this man had a charmed life, and he just kind of floated in and out. He worked really hard. I mean, he, he didn't make any money with these folks. They, 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 they didn't pay him, maybe expenses, but he did it for love. I mean, for love, that was his art. He made money and supported his family with the commercial work that he did. Why did but, they pay him? You know, it's a it's a very good question. I think I think I think uh, I mean you're you're dealing with Frank Lloyd Wright, who was probably was a genius, who was had a huge ego, and I and I think Frank Lloyd Wright said, I don't, I'm assuming that perhaps you come along and you get to photograph me and do my work, and that's enough. I guess I don't know. That's a very very good question, and uh, and with Calder and with Nelson, the same thing. He did it because he wanted to do it. But he got a call that at least there is a part. We're going on to some other questions yeah. here. <laughs> His house, right? Yes. <laughs> As a filmmaker, how, how, what are some of the lessons for, for others who are interested, like you, in uncovering this story that, that probably would never have come to life the way you have brought it to life? Tell us about your struggles or your challenges of bringing someone to life who was never recognized for most of his career, or fully compensated except for maybe the, the media work that he did. But anyway, what, what are some of the, the, the larger stories that you can tell us based on your experience? Well, you, know, um, you know, why make this film? I mean, this film kind of 
came along. You know, it came along. I mean, I think, I think you just have to, like, part of it's fate. You know, I believe in that. And the same way that Calder came along or Wright came along for Pedro, Pedro came along for us, for our team. Because I got to meet him, got to know him for 30 years, and we made a film. So the challenges here were not so much filmmaking challenges. The challenges were raising the money and getting it on the air. And that's, that's the biggest challenge for, for filmmakers. That, that was tough. We, got, we shot this in 2010. It languished in 2012. He died, and then there was attention. And then uh, uh, my son David cut a trailer, four or five minute trailer. We showed it to Latino Public Broadcasting, and they saw it and they said, wow. And so they put in a couple hundred thousand dollars. We had a cut a year ago, and no more money, and we got uh, Michael Cantor at uh, American Masters interested in it, and still we had to get money. I mean, we were, we were trying to beat the clock. He wanted he wanted this, the film, but we were still short a couple hundred thousand dollars. So fortunately, you just the thing is, on these films, you never give up. You never give up. And I, you know, I talked to Harley and Maria in their house, kind of like bemoaning, saying, "Oh, you know, we got this deadline, no money." And so what happened is that at the end, we just kept on pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until we got the money out of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The Castellano Family Foundation helped us out. The Berkeley Film Foundation helped us out. You know, Ken was like burning the midnight oil trying to make our deadlines because we had a middle of July deadline to finish the film and deliver it. And we had no archival masters in. I mean, it was a team effort. You know, this is like any other film. It just they, They're just hard to make. And the tough part is you you know, the creative stuff is the fun stuff, but we have to do all the other stuff, which is raising money and producing and convincing people that this is a good story. People were saying at American Masters, why didn't we know about Pedro Guerrero? We knew about Julius Schumann and Edward Stoller, and I said, well, now you do. You know, <laughs> you know, it's because somebody had to bring it to you. And now they're, you know, they're very, very, I mean, American Masters is the first, I think, the first Mexican-American or U.S. Latino ever on their series. Yes. So, just following up on that, th does that mean that there's no coffee table books about his work, or who's, who's that it's over here? Oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there, you know there are. Oh, okay. So, look up Pedro E. Guerrero, not Pedro Guerrero. It's a baseball pitcher. Right. <laughs> Pedro E. Guerrero. And there's and there's several books. There's they published the second edition of Picture and Write. So there's two books on Write. There's a couple books on Calder. Uh, and there's a book of, called The Photographer's Journey, which is about Pedro and, and, and his life story. Uh, beautiful images here. Uh, we have time for one more question over here, and then I have a very brief comment before we conclude. So um, it looks like uh, uh, Guerrero didn't have formal education in architecture. What? He didn't have formal education in architecture, and his exposure to architecture was through Franklin Wright. Uh, do you think that he was an architectural photographer, or he was a photographer who happened to stumble into architecture? Because I see continuity also in the non-architectural work, in the kind of an anthropological layer, in the way he... he Be Pedro um, charmed Wright, because he told Wright that he looked at his architecture as sculpture, and that seduced Seduced him, and so that I mean, he basically acknowledged right not just an architect as, as an artist, and so he approached architecture as uh, as as sculpture or as art. But the other thing is that other architects have had photographers that they've kind of molded, and I think there was some molding. I think I think he learned a lot from from Wright. I think Wright molded him and made him into an architectural photographer. I think that's what happened. I think, and he was 22 years old with a symbiotic relationship. And I think that's I think that's what happened. It was in the twenty years Wright trained him the way he wanted him, and he went on. Uh, one very brief concluding comment. I just wanted to flag for a moment the moral courage that Pedro Iguodeto displayed in relation to Vietnam, and it came with a cost. At a critical moment, he did something unusual. And having seen the film again, the artistry of Ray and his colleagues in bringing to life the man and his artistic achievements
to look at Wright's work, so familiar, yet in a very different way through these photographs, or to understand Calder in the perspective that Pedro E. Guerrero gives us, or Louise Nevelson. So for that, we owe all of them a thanks, and we owe particular gratitude to Ray Teus and his colleagues for this achievement.